In this session we are going to explain the issues surrounding make versus buy and outsourcing decisions, as well as calculating the costs associated with each option to enable us to decide on the best option from a financial perspective. We are also going to apply relevant costing principles in situations involving shutdowns, one-off contracts and the further processing of joint products. I am going to assume that you have a sound understanding of relevant costing on which we are going to build these topic areas. So if you need to brush up on this area, please watch the video on relevant costing before going any further with this video. Before we have a look at any techniques for dealing with these sorts of decisions, let's first of all consider the issues surrounding short-term decision making. The first thing we need to consider is the resources available to us, and whether there is any restriction on any of those resources. Where there are restrictions, we can of course use limiting factor analysis or linear programming to help us ensure that we make the best use of our scarce resources, to maximise contribution and therefore profit. Further information on these two techniques can be found on the videos covering these topic areas. These techniques would be used when considering which products to make in-house and in what priority order. We also need to think about whether there are other options available to us when resources are scarce. Should we make the products in-house or should we pay to have them made? Within this decision, we not only need to consider the cost of buying the product in, but we also need to think about the quality of the product being made for us. If the product quality isn't as good as the item being made in-house, should the decision be made to outsource and risk a loss in reputation, or should production be kept in-house to maintain reputation? Or is quality not a major factor for our customers? We should also think about continuity of supply and lead times, if we are considering outsourcing production, as we need to ensure that we can meet customer demand. If we cannot meet demand, there is a risk that our customers will go elsewhere, and we will not only lose that sale, but we may lose all future sales to that customer. It is also wise to consider whether you will be tied to a supplier for a fixed period of time. What is the minimum contract term or minimum purchase quantity? Does this affect our future plans? If the resource that is scarce now becomes available in the future, we may want to stop buying the product in and start making it in-house again, given that it is likely to cost more to buy than to make. And it is also good to check whether the supplier has the appropriate skill set to replicate the product that we are currently making in-house. Or indeed, does the supplier have specialist skills that we don't currently have in-house or don't wish to focus our time on? Maybe we want to outsource our HR function so that we can focus on increasing our sales volumes and sales revenue. We could hire a specialist HR company to provide that service for us, thereby giving us time to focus on increasing those sales. There may be other factors specific to the company in question that also need to be considered, such as confidentiality, ethical considerations or union involvement if work is outsourced. This list of factors is not exhaustive but gives you an idea of the sorts of considerations that need to be taken into account, as well as the cost and financial implications when considering whether to outsource a part of our business. The rest of this video focuses purely on the financial impact of our decisions but these other factors should be borne in mind before a final decision is made. Before we move on, we need to remember a few key features of relevant costing. So as a reminder, fixed costs are ignored unless they change as a result of the decision. We only consider future cash flows. And we only consider changes in those cash flows as a result of the decision we are making. So we are only interested in future incremental cash flows. Where there is spare capacity, it will usually make financial sense to make products in-house, as the variable cost of making will usually be lower than the cost of buying in a ready-made product. If, however, the cost of buying in does happen to be lower than the variable costs of manufacture, we would of course opt to buy in, as this will increase our contribution per unit and therefore our overall profit. Where there is no spare capacity and we are not meeting demand, we then need to consider which products we should make in-house and which we should buy in. To cover the technique we need to use, we are going to run through a numerical example. 
Funky Shirts Limited make four products, the retro, the vintage, the modern and the futuristic shirt. The material cost per unit is $5 for a retro, $6 for a vintage, $7 for a modern and $8 for a futuristic. Labour costs are $2, $4, $3 and $1 respectively and variable overheads are $1, $2, $2 and $1. We can calculate the total variable costs to be $8 for a retro, $12 for a vintage, $12 for a modern and $10 for a futuristic. We also have the option to buy in each of these products at a cost of $9 for a retro, $11 for a vintage, $14 for a modern and $12 for a futuristic. We can immediately see that it is cheaper to buy in the vintage shirts than to make them in-house. So clearly it would make sense from a financial perspective to buy vintage shirts in rather than making them in-house. We also need to look at the fixed costs we might save by buying in products rather than making them. So if we assume that we would save $1500 of fixed costs by buying in retro shirts, we would save $1000 by buying in vintage shirts, we would save $2,000 by buying in modern shirts and we would save $500 by buying in futuristic shirts. We can now work out the total saving or extra cost of buying in rather than making. We can now see that not only is it wise to buy in vintage shirts but we should also consider buying in retro shirts as we can make a saving of $500 based on a demand of 1,000 units. On the other hand, it costs an extra $4,000 to buy in modern shirts compared to making them and an extra $1,500 in the case of futuristic shirts. As already mentioned, this decision is purely based on cost savings and does not take into consideration the other important factors already discussed. It should also be borne in mind that by buying in the retro and vintage shirts, this may result in there being idle labour or machine hours, which will still need to be paid for and that this may not have been taken into account in the cost calculations we have just performed. An idle workforce can also result in an unmotivated workforce and therefore efficiency might be affected and the labour cost per unit could start to rise for those products that are being made in-house. The next area we are going to look at is the decision regarding shutting down part of a business's operations. We are going to use relevant costing again here to determine whether the closure of a loss-making part of our business has a positive financial impact on the business as a whole or if it makes more sense from the perspective of the whole business to keep the product line or department running. What this means is that we need to look at the cost savings associated with the closure but we also need to look at the lost revenue resulting from that closure. The basic principle therefore is that we need to calculate the lost contribution remember that is sales minus variable costs, resulting from the closure and compare this to the fixed costs we would save through the closure. If the contribution lost is higher than the fixed costs saved then it makes more financial sense to keep the operation running. Whereas if the fixed cost saving is higher than the lost contribution it makes more financial sense to close the operation. Within the costing analysis we should also ensure we cover any costs of redundancies, any potential legal action resulting from the closure, any retraining of existing employees and compensation to customers awaiting products that they will now not receive. Again this only takes into account the financial implications of a closure and not any other issues such as staff morale, customer and competitor reactions, the company's reputation or the impact on our supply chain and so on. Relevant costing principles can also be used for pricing up one-off contracts. The incremental future cash flows associated with the contract such as increased labour costs, increased fixed costs, increased overheads and so on need to be combined to find the total relevant cost of the contract. The minimum price will then be the total of these future incremental cash flows. If the contract price is lower than the relevant costs, then the contract should be declined from a financial perspective. There may however be other factors that mean a company would take on the contract despite the potential loss. This might be the case where a long-standing customer needs a one-off contract fulfilling. Whilst the revenue from this contract might not cover the associated costs, 
it is highly likely that there will be more contracts coming our way in the future from this customer, so you would be more than happy to take the hit now to ensure these future profitable contracts. The final area we are going to cover on this video is the decision about whether to take a joint product or products and process them further rather than selling them at the split off point. A joint product happens when two or more products are made from the same processing operation and they are roughly equal in terms of selling price. A typical example would be processing milk to make yoghurt and cream. For comparison purposes a by-product occurs when turning milk into cheese. The main product is the curd for the cheese and the by-product is the whey. We are only considering joint products here and we are only considering those that could go through a further production process or processes to give rise to another product. As we are using relevant costing here we are not interested in the cost of the joint product at the time of split off as these costs are effectively sunk costs. We want to decide whether to take the joint product and do more with it. At the split off point the joint product already exists and therefore the costs in making it have already been incurred and are therefore sunk. We need to compare the extra costs of processing with the increase in the selling price as a result of the further processing to determine if we are going to make more contribution by continuing with processing or by selling the product at the split off point. So we need to find the incremental revenue that would be generated by the higher selling price of the product going through more production processes and compare this to the incremental costs of those production processes. Where the incremental revenue is higher we should go ahead with the further processing but if the incremental costs are higher than the incremental revenue then we should sell the products off at the split off point without further processing. Do remember that we are only considering cash flows here so any incremental costs, savings or revenues that are not cash flows should be ignored.